Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Spatins. I will be talking about uh, OAuth 2.0 in OpenID Connect. Uh, I was um, uh, well put to order by uh, 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 by a former colleague that OpenID and OpenID Connect is are something completely different. So uh, that's already put straight. Um, so I am Tim Spatins. I am a, a freelance uh, system engineer since uh, recently only. Uh, I've been working on an API project at the Brussels Airport Company, and that's where I got to uh, appreciate OAuth and OpenID Connect as a authentication mechanism and authorization mechanism uh, commonly used in APIs these days. So this is what I, I'm going to talk about. So uh, we've come a long way since uh, the web was invented. That will, will be the uh, introduction, then some overview on OAuth. OAuth is a fairly, uh, well, let's say broad, but still uh, complex uh, uh, well, specification. I'm going to try to uh, simplify it to the extent that it is uh, comprehensible. Um, I won't be uh, putting in the gory details in this overview, neither uh, on all other slides. I will go into some detail, though, during the demo. So there's some grant types I will be talking about. Again, this will not be an extensive list. Uh, it'll b just be the ones that are applicable to APIs. And um, as such, I will be omitting things like uh, devices and that, so that sort of thing. Um, an important concept as well uh, in uh, OAuth is tokens and scope. So I'll be covering these uh, briefly as well. Then OpenID Connect um, is an extension, if you want, uh, on OAuth for doing authentication. Uh, we'll be covering this and then a small demo on uh, OpenID, uh, OpenID Connect. So let's get started. Um, in the beginning, there was HTTP. I think we're all at the age that we uh, started our Linux careers as uh, being the admins of uh, HTTP servers. And um, well, I am safe to say that uh, we didn't really care about authentication. It was public data anyway, right? And if it were, then we, well, we might uh, think of uh, maybe basic authentication, but it was not much to do anyway. So we protected the things that were sensible uh, with basic authentication, hopefully with uh, SSL, uh, we, I don't know. Um, and then, well, things evolved and we, uh, we had some applications which then uh, Tim O'Reilly dubbed Web 2.0. Uh, great. So we uh, moved some, some stuff to a form-based authentication and that was working fine. We didn't have any interconnected applications. We just uh, thought that form authentication or form-based authentication would do the trick. Um, and uh, we were fine. Meanwhile, we had our Active Directory, or not yet Active Directory, uh, and we, uh, we started to love the fact that we could authenticate once. We logged into our Windows computers, um, and uh, we could uh, access just about any resources, uh, be it uh, the intranet, uh, uh, intranet websites, uh, uh, whatever, SQL Server, uh, that sort of uh, funny things. Um, but yeah. Kerberos uh, works uh, great, but it doesn't cross the, the boundaries of our uh, enterprise. But we had single sign-on, and we were happy about it, right? Um, but, yeah, well, everything was mostly inside our own data center. It was mostly client-server. Uh, there weren't many interactions between our applications, which we protected with uh, Kerberos. There was no interaction with the form-based authentication. It was kind of all separated things things evolved um, in multiple uh, aspects, I think. Uh, first of all, a lot of what we are using and consuming as services now uh, has moved out of the data center. People that still run their Exchange server internally are, uh, well, rapidly, uh, uh, the numbers are rapidly de declining. Uh, so that is one service that already moved out. Uh, Dropbox for business is something else, uh, or maybe the OneDrive of uh, Microsoft. Uh, so, all of a sudden, we had this nice little thing called Kerberos that protected all our resources. And now, all these resources have moved out, and we can't use uh, Kerberos anymore, or not easily, at least. And with the APIs that, uh, Eve, that, that, came, all, uh, that, that came along with uh, the, this, this um, evolving infrastructures, um, people started to find out interesting use cases uh, to use 
data from one service in another service. And um, so we had like different interactions that didn't really match with neither form-based authentication or whatever password credentials and uh, didn't match with, with Kerberos either. Um, and so that's the problem because if we, um, if we look at how things were done and we would match it or map it on, on to our new uh, paradigms, that just doesn't fit. Uh, we can't just ask a user for their credentials to go fetch their whatever photos on whatever uh, storage service. So we can't uh, ask a user for credentials to do something else. I mean, w which user in these days will still just give out their credentials? And that, is, uh, that has been the, um, uh, the core problem of many data breaches in the past. So if you summarize this, um, we, we need to have some kind of a valid key. So a, a key that does only unlock whatever you are entitled to and also maybe expires in a, in a way to, to uh, protect our resources and continue to protect them, but still give these API services the, the ability uh, to do what they need. If I want to uh, use some kind of a cloud printing service to uh, access my photos, then it still needs to access the, those photos that I want to allow them to. Um, and meanwhile, I don't want to give them complete full access, uh, read write to my, uh, my cloud storage. So we need this. <coughs> so enter OAuth. Um, uh, OAuth uh, being, well, um, I don't know if they intentionally left off the Z or the N, uh, but uh, primarily uh, OAuth is an authorization protocol. Um, and it is so much focused on uh, being an authorization protocol that it intentionally leaves out the authentication uh, mechanism and leaves it to the implementation of the, uh, uh, of the service that uh, you're trying to use as a resource, uh, that, well, as an authorization server for your resources. Um, it uses access tokens um, being um, a means to tell the service you're trying to access a resource um, that you are the one you're uh, claiming to be with everything else, but the API uh, mechanism using these tokens for those APIs, it's really simple. It gets a token that is supposed to give them access. They can use it as such. They don't, they don't need to have uh, any, don't need to do any processing. So also something really important is that the, um, the access can be limited, limited in both ways. Um, we have uh, tokens that are expiring we can define ourselves how long tokens are, uh, are valid. And also we can limit the access rights to a token. For example, the cloud printing service doesn't need to have right access to any of our uh, photos. It just needs to fetch them. It, don't need, it doesn't need to update them. Um, and for OAuth, um, it, it, uh, it is covering many uh, API use cases. Um, so the very... Uh, Large ones and the small, uh, smaller use cases are covered with different grant types, which we will be, will be covering in uh, one of the next slides. Uh, very important as well with OAuth is that it is delegating access to a resource with the user knowing about, and even it, uh, the user explicitly has to grant some, uh, uh, ha has to gr uh, grant the API access to these resources. Um, many, uh, uh, many people uh, implement the tofu mechanism, so trust once um, and then trust on first use, uh, exactly, uh, thank you, um, which helps uh, protect security in two ways. First of all, um, it, uh, it is a nice balance between the user needs to really um, uh, tell the, the server, uh, service, I agree, you, you access my data. On the other hand, it doesn't make him uh, sick and tired of clicking OK, you can access the thing easier. Um, but user consent is really important. <coughs> and as we will see with OpenID Connect, also the OAuth uh, protocol is uh, flexible enough to be uh, extensible. Uh, so you can define your own tokens if you want. Although uh, I believe for uh, normal use cases, uh, some standard uh, will already have uh, evolved. Uh, so in an API world, we have um, a little bit more interactions between components. It's not just the user accessing a resource and it sends a token along. There's also a, uh, an API that, that sits in the middle. So let's define a couple of roles in this interaction so that the, the stage is clear. 
So first of all, we have the resource owner, also known as the user that has photos on the cl cloud ser service, for example. We have the client application, and this is sometimes um, a little bit um, uh, you know, confusing because the client is actually the API service. The API service that will um, act on behalf of the user to access the protected resources. Um, so that's already the fourth, uh, sorry for the spoiler. The third one is the authorization service. So there is one service that um, makes sure that as the, the, the user is authenticated and has granted whatever the client asked for. We'll uh, look at this in a little bit uh, more depth in one of the next slides. And so the protected resources are typically the, the photos, uh, whatever else the, the API can uh, hold for you. So typical flow is um, more or less like this. I found this on the uh, one of the tutorials. I'll be referencing it in the uh, last section as well. One of DigitalOcean, but there's many of them. Um, so basically, the flow goes like this. Um, the user is using some application. It reg registers for the cloud printing, whatever, accounting, uh, cloud service. I think GDPR all the time <laughs> in this case, but anyway. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the, the client is using this application, and he said, well, uh, I want to... Um, uh, um, to have my, my photos, uh, vacation photos printed, and they reside on this uh, storage server. So in some way, um, of course, the application will know how to handle this kind of, uh, this, this whatever Google, Google Drive photos. So it'll, um, it'll know how to request for the permission. <coughs> so it makes the client connect to the authorization service um, with some kind of a weird um, request uh, where it asks for uh, the client's uh, consent for these resources. Then the, the, the client is, or sorry, the, um, the user is redirected to a screen where he can give uh, consent. And so um, the clients of, uh, in this uh, will then receive a token um, to uh, be able to access the resources. Um, we'll be uh, covering the specifics uh, in, in one of the, the next. The important thing is authorization only after the user has been uh, asked for. Uh, so we have different, um, different types of uh, grants. Uh, the most complex one, but the most secure, is the uh, authorization code grant type. Um, if you have like um, a, uh, a normal application, uh, you have your own API, your users are on the internet, and you want to access some other internet service, this is the one you probably want uh, to implement. There's the uh, implicit grant type. Uh, it is entirely possible that your application is no, not on any whatever service uh, or server, but that it runs entirely in JavaScript on the browser. Then there's little dis distinction between the client requesting some, some resource and the user. Um, and so there is some interactions just don't make sense if it is the same, same application, the browser, um, doing them. So that's the implicit grant type. Um, there is also a client credentials grant type. Um, this is uh, if um, the application itself is um, the, resource uh, the resource owner. Um, imagine um, an application that has access to uh, whatever uh, data uh, from public transportation. Uh, it can be uh, the, the, the uh, transpo public transportation data can be protected by uh, uh, well, uh, as a resource, but the client application may, for example, be a public service that uses it and exposes this data to clients. So there is no distinction between the uh, application that uses the API and the application that actually owns the resources. So then client credentials type is the one yeah. that can be used. A fourth one, and um, it's marked with a little asterisk here, is resource owner credentials grant type. Um, Unfortunately, the people at OAuth decided that the um, anti-pattern that we want to avoid uh, can still be implemented. Um, and uh, if we look at, um, uh, I wanted to also uh, mention uh, uh, one of the quotes uh, yesterday, uh, Jan Piet, it's, uh, it's yours, with Ansible that you uh, don't uh, understand why social login uh, would, um, uh, would be preferred over LDAP. Um, I think LDAP is one of the, well, no, I don't think, uh, think it's, uh, it actually you are implementing with LDAP this, this kind of mechanism where you gladly accept user credentials and act on behalf of uh, your, your user 
so I think the OAuth or maybe OpenID Connect can be beneficial to uh, replace LDAP authentication with. Anyway, let's get into some more details. So, the first uh, grant type, authorization code. Um, so I already uh, uh, mentioned that authorization code is the one you probably want to implement unless you can't um, or it doesn't make sense. So in this case, the resource owner is a normal user. The client is an API service somewhere, being the cloud printing service. The protected resource are your photos. And the authorization service uh, server uh, obviously is tightly linked with the protected resources because it needs to know about it, more or less. At least the prote protected resources need to know something about the authorization service and uh, vice versa. So how does this thing work? So the, uh, the, the resource owner um, is on the uh, web service, say, for the um, uh, printing service. Um, and it clicks some buttons uh, just to be able to access the photos. Then, so the first step is that the client, so the API server, will make the user go to a web page with some kind of a redirect mechanism to ask for consent. Um, so this is the second step already. So the, the resource owner in his browser will get the pop-up um, with um, the question, please log on with whatever service you are uh, uh, trying to access photos for. for. And then the, six, uh, the second step is, uh, oh, you want to have these photos? Um, can I allow this service um, uh, access to your photos? On this request, um, hang on, let me. There is um, some kind of authorization mechanism. And depending on uh, the grant type, this can be the authorization service calling back into the uh, client with uh, some code. Or it can be, uh, uh, hang on, the authorization server re replies with the, uh, uh, an authorization code, which is sent back to the, to the client. And there is also some interaction in the, uh, the back end. Um, uh, being the client with its authorization code can fetch the real code, the real access token from the authorization server. So there's some, some things going on in the back channel. Uh, which is kind of an advantage because the, the resource owner cannot do anything about it, neither can the client. Uh, so the authorization service, uh, server performs um, uh, an important mechanism or uses an important mechanism to uh, avoid fiddling around with. Then with this access token uh, that the client has uh, uh, obtained in some form or another, it can then um, access the portals wherever you want. At least not, not whatever you want whatever the, the resource owner granted it access for. <coughs> a second uh, grant type is the implicit grant type. Uh, this is typically, as I already mentioned before, if there is no real distinction between the API service and the resource owner's interaction, uh, for example, if it all happens inside the browser, then it doesn't make sense to all this complicated stuff because already calling back to the, to the client will be next to impossible. The, the, the client is acting inside a, a, a browser. And so there is a specific uh, way of doing the same thing um, within, within a browser. Now, of course, there is no, uh, there is no way of uh, protecting whatever the client is using to authenticate itself. Um, and so the, there, is, uh, there are some drawbacks in implementing it this way but it is possible. Uh, as we'll see, I didn't really mention it in, it in the previous slide explicitly, it was on the, on the notes. The client also has some kind of an authentication me mechanism against the authorization service. So it can only access uh, some, well, it, it can only uh, request uh, an access token based on its own credentials. And uh, it also needs this, this authorization code. Now in this case, obviously, the client still needs to authenticate itself. But the credentials for it will live in the browser as well. So this is the, the biggest drawback anyway. So in this case, the, the client still, um, um, in some form or another, uh, redirects the resource owner to the right pages to grant access. Once the, uh, the user clicks on, OK, I'm, I am Tim, uh, I allow you access to my photos, uh, there's still um, uh, the uh, uh, there's still the client obtaining a token uh, to then access uh, the protected resource. Um, let's get to the next one. 
Client credentials, so this is also a rather simple uh, exchange of tokens. The, the client uh, already has its credentials with it. It has a client ID, it has a secret, it just uh, has the authorization service for a token, uh, which it can then use uh, to access the protected resource. It all looks a little bit um, fluffy right here, but I think if I uh, added the, the details, it, would, it wouldn't be, uh, uh, well, it would be too complicated. Um, and then the last one is the uh, uh, resource owner credentials. It looks similar to the, to the previous one, uh, although uh, there's one, uh, one catch, obviously. Uh, the resource owner gratuitously, gratuitously only, uh, almost uh, uh, gives uh, the credentials to the, uh, to the client server, uh, to the client or the uh, API server. Uh, this is obviously what we want to avoid, so uh, this is only last resort thing. Uh, something about uh, tokens. Um, so there's there's lots of codes floating around all the time, um, and um, I, from um, from experience, um, I uh, get confused all the time. So let's uh, get things uh, straight as well on tokens and codes and whatever. So oftentimes uh, there is um, uh, uh, people talk about uh, authorization codes. Uh, this first code is just random string or whatever that is returned by the uh, authorization server to be given back to the client so that the client can obtain the real token using its own credentials from the authorization server. So going back a couple slides, um, it would be a token that is generated by the authorization server sent back through the resource owner to the client so that the client can use it using its credentials to get the real token from the server. Then access tokens are the ones that are obtained from the server that can be used to go fetch the resources at the resource end, right? Um, these access tokens are completely opaque. Um, it can just be, uh, be anything. Uh, it is just a matter of having the authorization server and the, pre and the server that protects the resources, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, agree on what they should should be sending. Uh, usually, this one is uh, uh, no. This one, yeah, well, uh, confusion. Uh, it, it may j just be anything. Um, one of the types is the or author. Uh, sorry. Um, once more. So the access tokens are the ones that you obtain from the authorization server, and can be used to access the um, the resources. Um, it, its type is of type bearer token, so whatever mechanism obtains this token, it can be used to access the resource. There's no um, other protection mechanism than you have the token, uh, you can access the resource. Think of a, a, a 50 uh, euro note, you have the token, you can exchange it for whatever it's worth. Uh, there's also another mechanism uh, called uh, refresh uh, token. So the idea is the following. If you have authorized a um, web printing service uh, to access your photos, that doesn't mean that the uh, printing service will immediately go fetch your, uh, your photos. And also, we want to limit the access token in lifetime uh, because um, it may get intercepted by any service on, on the way. Uh, so we don't want to, um, uh, to have uh, uh, this, this token that is sent over the wire to live forever. And that is why uh, refresh tokens are also part of the, uh, the OAuth mechanism. The idea is you have this token, you have this uh, request uh, from, uh, you have, some, uh, you have send, send a request to the authorization server, it gets you two tokens. The one is used to access the resource, and the second one is the one that you, you can use to refresh the token to access the resource once it, ex uh, it is expired. Uh, so this mechanism prevents um, uh, two things. If the bearer token is, um, is intercepted, it is still invalid after X period of time, so the, uh, the timeout, uh, but it still allows the, uh, uh, the service that needs access to these resources uh, to get a new token. Yeah. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I can actually impersonate it. Uh, not impersonate. You can access the resources I granted to server. Yeah. 
Um, yes. Uh, no, uh, every token has an expiry, which you can specify. I yeah, but I think this one is another type of token. This might not may not be an OAuth token, but uh, some kind of uh, an API uh, service uh, credential or something, uh, which is well more or less the equivalent of username and password, but then. Uh, with, with well, with with, crypt, uh, with crypt, uh, cryptic uh, description, so you can have multiples for the same account or something. Um, so, next one. Uh, so, remember the cloud printing service. Um, remember that it has to ask you for some kind of right in a folder, some kind of right access right somewhere on the photos. This is what scopes are all about. You don't have to implement this, but um, uh, you can uh, to avoid people reading, uh, uh, to avoid the people that, might, uh, that, they, that you want to grant read access to actually write things to your, uh, your resources. Um, so it can be used to, and this, this is not in the OAuth specification, you, you'll have to uh, consult the API documentation. Um, this, is, um, uh, this can be used to uh, Define subsets, um, say whatever folders in your uh, storage, uh, or, for, uh, or for example, uh, access rights types like you can read, you can write, you can share, whatever. Um, and of course, this is uh, highly dependent on the resource service because, yeah, well, some resource services it just, just doesn't make sense, and for others, the, uh, the scopes are obvious. It is a space separated list uh, in the demo, there's a very small. Uh, scope for the OpenID Connect. Any questions so far? Right. It gets a little hairy from here. So we have these tokens. These tokens can be arbitrary, uh, but uh, there is some special token called the JWT. JWT is um, a JSON Base64 encoded uh, um, uh, token, uh, which is signed. Now, why is this? Um, in this four boxes picture, um, you can always uh, use the resource, sorry, the resource service can always use the authorization server uh, to ask it, hey, is this a valid token? But this is an additional round, round trip time. And potentially with APIs, you use a token not only once, but like 50,000 times in half an hour. Um, if this um, um, resource server always needs to go validate somewhere, um, its tokens, and let's hope it caches the, the token validity, it is still one round trip. One, uh, round trip. It would be nice if the, um, if, if the resource uh, service <coughs> could, uh, based on the token, find out what, uh, who you are, um, what you can do, and then also validate that it is not a forged token. And this is what the uh, JSON Web Token is. So basically, it is a self-contained uh, uh, self and signed token that contains everything a resource uh, service needs. Um, I think I said everything. So there's no additional call needed to the authorization server. Uh, this is one, so find the dots. Here's one, and here's the next. So the first uh, thingy is some kind of a header. Let's decode it, it's a lot, a lot easier. Um, with an algorithm and some kind of uh, key ID or something. Um, second one is the payload. So this, for example, is an OpenID token, which is also a JWT token. Uh, it contains some funny stuff. Uh, the most important thing is, uh, in this case, the subject, um, subject which uh, um, uh, defines me at Google. So this is uh, my Google account ID number, I guess, uh, with some additional information. Um, very important in this case is, oops, is the expiry and the issuer. Um, these uh, uh, are um, found in most tokens, so the, um, the uh, issuer is some kind of uh, identification for the authorization server, and of course the expiry, uh, this token will expire in some, in some uh, seconds. It might have expired already. Um, 
we'll get back to this ticket uh, because it contains some more for OpenID. So OpenID connect authentication with OAuth. The problem with uh, authentication um, is, in this case, that OAuth is actually designed to do authorization only. Um, that's kind of a pity, right? Uh, so, and, and, and even the, the, um, uh, the specification pushes everything that is real authentication out of scope. Uh, so this is a good thing because then you can implement, uh, imagine that you want to have Amazon to have uh, whatever special tokens implemented uh, for doing two-factor authentication that doesn't uh, have to affect or have to be included in the standards. So this, this is a good thing, but it's also a little bit of an annoyance if you want to use uh, uh, this token system for authentication. Fortunately, uh, OAuth uh, is designed with extensions in mind, uh, and so this is uh, more or less what OpenID Connect is about. Um, so it is an OAuth extension. Um, it provides pseudo authentication. So what you actually do with OAuth is, uh, sorry, with OpenID Connect is use the OAuth authorization framework to authorize the service to some protected user info resource. And on top of that, they also uh, provide you with an additional token um, that uh, contains some kind of an information you want to, you want to have um, uh, an indication when the user actually signed in, right? Um, if you have a, a, a token that gives you access to user info, it doesn't necessarily say when exactly did this be, uh, did I get this grant, and this is the ID token. This is the same token as before, uh, and then uh, the, the the one special thing is the I at is uh, I I believe that this one is the. Uh, uh, the code. There may be some additional things also related. Uh, I must admit that I'm not the master of OpenID, but uh, there is some more in this token to do specifics uh, for authentication. Um, then accessing the user resource. So we have this, uh, this token. Uh, we can use the, uh, uh, well, the bear token to go fetch the user info resource. And this is what gets uh, back to it if you uh, would be fetching my info. <laughs> if I would have logged into your service, this is the user info that uh, would be returned. Uh, obviously, you don't want to do uh, all this yourself. Um, I will be doing some, well, rather low-level stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, most likely, you want to use some uh, authorization server like uh, Keycloak or maybe uh, the uh, Epsilon or maybe another one. With OpenID Connect, you don't have to because it's obviously the, the, the authentication provider, the social uh, provider that uh, has the, uh, the, the server for you. So let's have a look if I can find a way to show this to you. So the, the demo is really, really simple. Uh, I will just do more or less what I had in the slides, um, but then uh, on the command line or in the... Um, uh, or in the browser. Um, let's see. Uh, anyone want to sacrifice to the demo gods? So, um, the first thing I'm going to do um, is show you the um, the client. So I, um, on my uh, Google account, I created some kind of whatever project called My Low Days. Um, let me. Yeah, I a few things. Uh, so this is the uh, console from Google. Hopefully, yep. Uh, so you see the My Lodes project, and within the credentials of uh, this project, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, Lodes project, you see the client IDs I created. So I, cre uh, I created one web client. If you look at the web client's um, credentials, hang on. So every uh, API you want to use with uh, OAuth 
Um, think of it as an application, right? Every application is a client for what OAuth is concerned. It needs to reg be registered at the API provider um, in the authorization server. Uh, and in this case, so my client ID is uh, this one, uh, and it's secret, so uh, is this one. It will use these two to authenticate itself as, hi, I am being the web client one piece of the MyLodes project uh, of Teams patients who registered it on Google. Um, so this, these two things we will need to, um, uh, we will need to uh, pass uh, to the uh, to the authorization server, but we want to do it uh, uh, in a way uh, that oh, this is uh, sad. Let me do something else. So we want to do it in a way that um, uh, the um, the authorization server that, that the user is actually the one initiating the uh, the connect uh, the, the connection or the request. Uh, let me find out if I can do this in another way. If I do it this way. Oh, that was maybe not the brightest solution. Um, this is what I'm going to fetch uh, to, to uh, paste in the browser uh, soon. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is the redirect URI. Um, so this client, um, the the way Open uh, uh, Auth wor uh, works is this client is authorized to redirect you again to itself, and this is uh, specified in the uh, redirect uh, URLs. Uh, so the, you can add a list. Uh, you can have multiple services um, in one application that do more or less the same thing. Um, it, may be the f it may be the case that you want to redirect to some other page after having the authorization code. But I added just this one. Um, just to be sure, I didn't implement anything. So I will be having a, a, some whatever uh, browser problem in my, uh, in my client. That's no, that's no big deal because we can still uh, take the code out of the, uh, of, out of the uh, URL. Um, so let's get back to here. So if I paste this thing in um, a browser, bear with me. Um, uh, I thought I'd save this somewhere, but... Uh, yeah, just a second. My apologies for delays. So, uh, you'll have to believe me that this is correct. So, I am getting redirected to the authorization server right now, where I see already, hey, I'm um, doing something with my Lodes, right? Um, there's a nice uh, a guide from Google how to uh, uh, customize this thing. Um, yeah, I want to use my own account, right? Um, it redirects me to something. But in the um, URL now, uh, there's the, uh, uh, the parameters on the, the get, the uh, whatever uh, parameters. So if we, um, analyze this one. Uh, that was not a good idea. We get something like this. Um, analyzing it. Uh, no. We have obviously our redirect URL, which was asked for in the previous uh, link, which was authorized by the authorization server as a redirect link. We are being sent there with some other uh, uh, parameters. And in here, 
Uh, come on, guys. In here we have the code which we will be using. Some more information, but let's uh, stick with the code. So, if you want to now obtain the user info, uh, This is the way to get it. Um, so I'll be using curl again, or uh, this time. There's a post request with grant type authorization code um, and the code in the data with some uh, identification of the client, with the client secret, again with the uh, your, uh, redirect URI to the uh, accounts page. Um, so we need to paste in the code from above. Let's do this. Oop, that won't work otherwise. Uh, let's see how we can fix this thing. Uh, this will be fun. Sorry for fiddling around a little bit too much. I didn't. Just to um, um, not scare you off, obviously this is all done by authorization servers and uh, client libraries. Uh, so if we use a token, hop hopefully it's not yet expired, we have the access token, which we can use later on to fetch the user info. Or what is the user info? Uh, so this was just the authorization um, and we have the ID token this ID token is the one or more or less uh, that I showed in um, uh, in the slides uh, notice the token type bear so it um, it contains everything which means I can decode it as a JWT there is a very nice website to do so JWT.io um, I didn't yet uh, search for due to lack of time the the key Google uses uh, for signing its keys uh, but we could even add it in this tool uh, hang on, I'm going to slightly reduce the size maybe it's better um, so we uh, we pasted in the JWT uh, it gets decoded as the header the payload and you can optionally if you want to uh, add the public key for Google's authentication service uh, and then this uh, site can also s uh, tell you that it is uh, uh, that, that the signature is, uh, is valid uh, would be nice if it would also say hey it's expired um, but uh, hang on well um, anyway so we have this uh, ID token which we can use to say someone really signed in uh, but we also have the access token um, just a second so if we want to use that one uh, there is a simple uh, HTTP call uh, which looks like which looks like this oops no ah come on <laughs> looks like this we need to have the um, code from our uh, well our access token uh, so that's this one Uh, 
There we go. Now, if we use this, come on, why don't you paste? I forgot. I uh, forgot the quote. Let's do it again. We have our user info. Um, which concludes my demo. Uh, there's also the picture inside. I had hoped it would be protected uh, or it would be returning my, my photo, but it, well, I didn't get it to work. Uh, it does uh, return the default uh, icon, so I must have done something wrong with access tokens or bear tokens or whatever. Uh, I should read the docs once more. So this concludes my demo. Uh, let's get back to the slides. Uh, so, to finish off, I wanted to just mention a couple of tools I've been using. Um, I didn't do any demo with SOAP UI Postman, but um, these are uh, a nice addition to uh, uh, any API developer's toolkit. Um, but I, uh, and I didn't really show Keycloak either, but Keycloak I uh, already referenced, uh, Epsilon as well. <coughs> yes, I know, but I didn't really use it in my toolbox. <laughs> anyway, sorry? So, uh, so Keycloak is, uh, an open source, that's already one thing, um, uh, authorization server. You can also use uh, Microsoft flavors, like uh, they have uh, what is called ADFS uh, for Active Directory Federation Services, I think, which is also an authorization server uh, that can be used in Microsoft environments, which would be the good alternative to LDAP queries. Um, JWT.io, I mentioned to decode the tokens. Uh, Get Postman and SOBUI, I, I, I should have put a demo on it uh, because it is a, a really, um, good uh, tool to test APIs. Uh, it has some nice click and point and click uh, 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 abilities to go fetch a token uh, and, to, and to use it straight away uh, with your APIs. Um, and uh, Postman and Sobi, I think, m are more or less the same. Uh, if you are using Swagger or anyone, uh, anything else from, uh, from SmartBear, uh, those guys are also the SOAP UI. Uh, then some documentation, so the, the specification can be found on oot.net slash 2 because the version uh, kind of matters. Um, I would also say that for anything that is specific to the APIs and the authorization mechanisms used for your APIs, that you should also consult uh, your favorite API uh, provider. Um, I found a nice tutorial on DigitalOcean, um, but there's lots and lots more if you look at the Twitter, if you look at uh, Google, if you look at any uh, any uh, party that does APIs, uh, many of them want to attract as many developers uh, as possible, so those uh, provide good things as well. I also uh, have liked the um, uh, Manning uh, book uh, a lot. Uh, I have it with me uh, right here, so the, uh, the OAuth uh, 2 in action book, um, which ha contains code uh, samples, uh, JavaScript based, but anyway, uh, to uh, demonstrate how, how things uh, work. Um, so uh, this was my presentation for today. Thank you for your attendance.